me make sure my microphone's on. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> we got it. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here. I have a few announcements for us this morning. The first is that later this evening at 5 p.m., we have a Taze worship service here in the sanctuary. This is a service of prayer, of healing, a time to really connect with God. And there's also an opportunity to have somebody pray with you um, about something that's going on in your life. It's, it's a wonderful, intentional service. So I hope you'll join us tonight, 5 p.m. for Taze. Also, just to put a little feeler out there, we will have another opportunity to worship midweek coming up soon, a worship service called Encounter. And more information will be out soon. As we kick up and get ready for the fall to start, we have the opportunity to register your children and youth for youth and children's choirs. Children's choirs will begin at 6.15 on Wednesday nights. You can go to the website and register your child th there. And if you're a youth or a parent of a youth, you can register for the youth choir, which will happen before small groups on Sunday nights. Also, if you're interested in being an acolyte and you're above the age of third grade, we have a training coming up and you'll talk to Maggie Gerald so that you can become an acolyte. Thanks, Noah, this morning for your service there. For those of you that missed out on the mid between the services, we've been doing some table talks in McWhorter Hall. So you can come next week, come around 945 and fellowship at the table with other folks from the congregation. Get to know someone. There's prompts that you can chat about. Um, it's really, really low key and an opportunity to eat donuts, drink coffee and meet someone new. And then the last Sunday, of July the 31st between the services we'll have a summer town hall meeting where you can learn more about what's going on in the faith I mean learn more about what's going on at West End and talk about our God-sized dreams that are happening right now this morning we encounter two strong women characters who are living the great commandment to love God and love neighbor. May we learn about our own discipleship this morning from them.
we gather today to praise God. We gather today to praise God for God's many gifts. We gather today to build community. God does love us unconditionally. Let us call to mind the times in our lives where we have turned away from God's love. And remember that despite our failings, God's love never fails. God of peace and justice, we confess the many ways we fall short of your love for us. We turn away from those in need. We ignore those we marginalize. We keep busy to protect ourselves from our obligations to others. We inflict hurt without realizing the harm we have caused. Open our hearts to receive your grace. Open our eyes to see your presence in every person and in all your creation. Give us the courage to be the loving light of Christ to all we meet. And now, O oh God, we offer to you our individual confessions in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of reconciliation and love. And you can do that here in the sanctuary as you feel comfortable. And if you're joining us online, you can exchange through the chat or with, your, with those with whom you're watching or send a text to someone. The peace of Christ be with you. One of the great joys of the church is the baptism of children. This morning, Jacob and Kara Van Osdal bring their daughter to God before the community of faith for baptism and present their family for membership. Family in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's free gift offered without price. I have a few questions for you. Jacob and Kara ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you do, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him in union with the church which Christ has opened to all people? I do. Will you nurture this child into Christ's holy church, and by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, profess her faith openly, and lead a Christian life? I will. Congregation, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your commitment to Christ and your rejection of sin? If so, say, we do. We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With, With God's, God's help, help we, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. 
we will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her to be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and you brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this child who receives it, to wash away sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in Christ's final victory. All praise to you, eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. What name is given this child? Eliza Lane. Eliza Lane. Eliza Lane, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll come and put your hands on Eliza Lane. Do you want to go over? There we go. All right, Eliza Lane. May the Holy Spirit work within you that being a true disciple of Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. And now this beautiful family will join our church this morning. So there's a few more questions. All right, just two more questions. Jacob and Kara, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. I will. As members of the body of Christ, in this congregation called to be the loving light of Christ in the world, will you faithfully serve Christ in this place through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I will. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Now we'll walk to the center and have the congregation affirm our commitments. Will the congregation please rise in body and spirit and face this family? Now is it, it is our joy to welcome you siblings in Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend Jacob, Kara, and Eliza Lane to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant to participate faithfully in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Join me in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. This is a lesson from the Gospel of Luke. 10, 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village 
where a woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. I'd like to invite all of the young, the children, or the young at heart to come forward for the children's time. For a second. Hi. Thanks for coming. Oh, hi, Ben. How's it going? Thanks for being here. Yes. Oh, I love it. See you guys. Okay, when I was growing up, and it was around Christmas time, my mom would buy my brother and I a big canister of popcorn. It was pretty big. And there were three flavors inside butter, cheddar, and caramel. Now, caramel, it's like a sweet, oh, yeah, yeah it's sweet. Caramel, yes. <laughs> you can say it both ways. Um, so, the caramel, the caramel kind was my favorite, and I loved it. I would eat it all up, and the cheddar kind was my brother's favorite, and he would eat all of that up. And because, you know, sometimes I was a little competitive with my brother, I would say, the caramel's better, and he'd say, no, the cheddar's better. 
And when I was a little bit older, I went to Chicago and I discovered that sometimes people there eat them together. And I don't know if you've ever had cheddar popcorn and caramel popcorn together, but they taste really good. It's probably even better that way. So this morning we have two sisters in the story. One is named Martha and the other one's name is Mary. And sometimes people will say, Martha exemplifies what it means to be a servant. She is doing a lot of stuff. She welcomes people into her home. She cooks meals for others. She's always hospitable and welcoming. And sometimes people will say that Mary represents prayer and being with God and just sitting in God's presence and feeling that love. And sometimes people will put them against each other, like one is better than the other. Kind of like my brother and I did with cheddar popcorn and caramel popcorn. But it's not about one or the other. They're not against each other. We can serve God. We can cook meals and welcome people into our home. And we can sit in God's presence and love God and feel the Holy Spirit at the same time. So it's kind of like that Chicago-style popcorn where they're better and best when they're together. Let's pray together and see if we can invite Jesus to help us in this journey of discipleship. God, we're so thankful that we can be here. Thank you for my friends who have come up. Help us all to be your disciple, to love you with our whole heart and to sit in your presence and also to share that love with others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't it pretty? It's red. It says Holy Spirit. Five and a half just seems so much older, you know? Five and a half. I guess you could do either. <laughs> Great. Last week when Carol began her sermon, she used the metaphor to describe how she felt about the story of the Good Samaritan. She said sometimes it's like laying back on a big mattress. It's comforting. But then she said after she read it a little bit more, she thought maybe it was like one of those 1970s pull-out couches that has the bar in the back and you can never quite get comfortable. Well, if I was going to extend her metaphor for the way I feel about this scripture passage, I think it's more of a pillow fight. And not one of those pillow fights where people are like dancing on the bed. This is a pillow fight where there is a broken lamp in the corner and somebody's got a black eye. Like... I wrestle with this scripture passage. Part of it you might recognize in the sermon title for this morning. At the end of this story, I'm like, well, yeah, but who's making supper? That kind of puts myself on blast a little bit. I've got a lot of Martha energy in me. <laughs> but that leads me to the next part that I wrestle with the most. If you're a Christian woman and you grew up in the church, likely somewhere along the lines, maybe it was at a retreat or a book study or a devotional, and somebody asked you, are you a Martha or a Mary? And you had to choose one or the other as if that's what you were supposed to do. My problem is not the paradigm that we create for these women, like I was telling the kids, the, the students here, of Martha exemplifying the servant leadership and Mary exemplifying what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But we know the end of the greatest commandment is to do the servant leadership as well. It's, you can't choose one or the other. It's not a choice. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we love the Lord your God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. See, this five-verse story is sandwiched right between the Good Samaritan story where Jesus talks about that greatest commandment and shows how we are to love our neighbor. And on the other side, right after this, Jesus teaches about the Lord's Prayer. 
probably the best way that we're able to connect with God, to sit in God's presence through prayer. It's not an either or. And what I think Luke, the writer of Luke, is doing here is saying, how are we going to incorporate both of these in our lives? So we find at the very beginning of the scripture passage, Martha and Mary doing their thing. They are living their best life. Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. And we know that Jesus doesn't really travel solo a lot, so she's probably got a whole entourage to say, well, I'm so glad you're here. And she does that. So she gets busy right away. She's starting to do the task. She's making the food, washing the things, doing the, you know, she's active and ready to go. Mary, on the other hand, she is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And when you sit at the feet of Jesus in the New Testament, it means that you're giving on it honor. You are fully present to the teachings and listening to the individual you're sitting at the feet. So Mary is doing that for Jesus. Both women are disciples doing exactly what they should be doing. And then we learn that Martha is a little bit distracted. And we also might infer that she's having some negative emotions, possibly feeling a little bit overwhelmed, possibly feeling alone, and possibly feeling a little resentment towards her sister Mary. And we know that because she kind of passive aggressively <laughs> says to Jesus, Lord, don't you see that I'm doing all of these things and my sister's doing nothing? Ask her to help me. <laughs> and when you put Jesus on the spot in any of the gospels, but especially in Luke, you're going to get an answer. And that answer is not always as clear as you want it to be. He responds, Martha, Martha. I love that he says her name twice because it shows me that he is caring for her. It's a term of endearment. He says her name twice because it's kind of like, kind of like when you write to your best friend, my dearest Jamie, my dearest Emily, like, oh, I, mm, Martha, Martha, you're distracted by many things. Only one thing is needed. Clear as mud, that one thing that's needed. Thanks, Jesus. What is the one thing that's needed, you know? And here's why I love being a progressive female preacher, because I can look and discover and wrestle and pillow fight with this to discover what is that one thing. And we can come up with a multitude of interpretations so that we can discover in this moment through this story, what is it that Jesus is saying to me? What is Jesus saying to us? So I have four interpretations I'd actually like to share with you about what Jesus might be talking about when he says only one thing is needed. And I'll start with the literal one. Okay, so Martha, she's in the kitchen. She's got her turkey and her chicken and the mac and cheese and the potato salad and the salad with the jello and the salad with the fruit and the salad with the real salad stuff in it and also the bread and also the pie. I mean, she has got the entire feast. And Jesus is like, Martha, Martha, you're distracted by many things. Only one thing's needed. You know I like macaroni and cheese the best. The holiest of foods. Um, so he's saying, wow, look at all that you're doing. Please keep it simple. It do, you don't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be so complex. Simplicity, Martha. Another interpretation came to me when, uh, when Carol was entered my office and she knew I was wrestling with this text and she was like, how's it going? <laughs> and I was like, well, I wish I was preaching to my students the first month or the first week of classes. Okay, imagine for a moment that you're off to college, maybe for the first time or maybe you're going in a month or so and you've been through your first week of classes and you have your syllabus and you're like, oh, I have to learn all that. And I have, I have to get all these books. I have to find my classes. I have to live with this new roommate that I don't even know. Maybe I like her. Maybe I don't. Uh, I have to find friends. I have to wash my clothes. I have to find food. I mean, think about all of the distractions. I sit with so many students that first week and I say, oh, 
it's okay to be overwhelmed. It's okay to have all these distractions. Just pick the next best thing, that one thing. Just put one foot in front of the other. Take it one thing at a time. Martha, Martha, you're distracted with so many things. Just, just only one thing is needed. It's okay. Step by step by step, we're going to get through all of this. The third and fourth interpretations are similar, but I think that they have different outcomes about what happens with Martha. And it's probably the most obvious one, the one that you probably thought of right away, what the one thing is. The one thing is the presence of God, Jesus Christ, right in front of her. And in this one, again, the story doesn't have an ending to it. We don't actually know what happens with Martha next. And so with this interpretation, I think Martha takes a deep breath. It's like, I feel so alone in my tasks. But that one thing, the presence of God, is with me. And I can go back to my tasks, and I can practice that presence of God. In the 19, I mean the 1600s, there was a monk named Brother Lawrence, and he wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And if that was all I told you, you might think that this book was about a bunch of spiritual disciplines, but it's not. He says that he goes to the hours and he meditates and he reads the scriptures, but he finds the presence of Christ most palpable in washing dishes. These daily mundane tasks because he knows that he's centered on the presence of God, the love of God, and he can do his tasks to share that love with others. The task isn't just about cooking meal. It's about cooking meal for my brothers that I can incorporate and show the love of God to. The task isn't just washing the dishes. It's saying, wow, God makes all things new and clean in my life. Focusing those mundane tasks on practicing God's presence daily. And the last interpretation, the one that we normally hear, is saying, the presence of God is right in front of you, Martha. And sometimes we hear this of, as Jesus being like, well, come and sit at my feet. No, Jesus isn't a narcissist. Jesus wants to offer her a glass of cold, refreshing water in the midst of a hot, humid summer day. He's saying, Martha, Martha, rest, rest. He says, Martha, your worth Your identity is not caught up in your productivity and all those things you do out there. Your worth is as a child of God. This is your true identity. You're not a widget maker for the system. You are loved and held within my presence and my love. And when you're held within my presence and my love, the work, yes, it's important, it's happening, but it becomes peripheral to the knowledge and acceptance that you are enough, and that in my kingdom, everyone has enough. It's an abundance mindset when all we can think about is the scarcity of not enough energy, not enough time, not enough resources. You move yourself into the heart of God that says, I can be okay even when the world is not okay. Breathing in and out that presence, that power, that abundance that Christ Jesus offers because Christ is the Savior of the world, not Martha, not us. See, this scripture passage is placed right in between the best story that we know how to love our neighbor as ourselves, that servant action. And the Lord's Prayer, one of the best ways that we know how to connect with loving God with our heart, mind, and soul. And the end of the story is unwritten. So we, as the readers, as the interpreters, get to live out that invitation to the one thing with our very lives. May it be so. Amen.
together in the name of God, only one thing is needed at this moment, and that is for us to rise in body or spirit and join our voices together to affirm our faith in this God who is indeed with us. You may find this on 883 in our United Methodist Hymnal. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of prayer, I invite you to lift up both your silent and spoken prayers. If you have prayer concerns that you would like to share with the pastoral team so that we might pray for them throughout the week, there are a couple of different ways you may do that. One is through our website, which is an especially good option for those worshiping online. Uh, just go to our website and follow the link under Contact Us, and you can place prayer concerns there. Also, if you're here with us in the sanctuary, you may find a gray card located in the pew racks in front of you. And you may put your prayer concerns on there and then place them in the offering plates as they make the rounds in just a few moments. This morning, our deepest prayers are with the Meyer family. We pray for Molly and Kirk and Callie and Charlotte Meyer, who are mourning the death of Molly's mother, Kim McAllister, who passed away July 10th in High Point, North Carolina. Services were held there July 14th. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of patient presence, there are so many things in this life that keep our attention turned away from you. There are so many ways that we believe we have to act or to do things in a certain way to prepare ourselves to receive you. If we are honest, we believe that we are the ones that make room for you. But today, we pray that you would remind us that you are already with us. You have arrived among us, and you seek to be our friend, our teacher, and our guide. Help us shape our doing and our being so that our lives always direct us back to the better part, to the reality of your love for us and to your sustaining presence. Today, as we come to you in prayer, we welcome you to our house, this beautiful house of worship, where we return each week to meet you face to face. We pray for each and every person gathered here. We pray for one another we celebrate one another's joys and accomplishments. We mourn one another's losses and disappointments. We hold one another in care and compassion so that all are welcome here in this house as we all gather around your feet. As we feel your presence fill this space and fill our hearts with grace, we lift up our personal prayers and petitions to you in a moment of silent prayer. And now, Lord Jesus, like Mary and Martha, we give thanks for your visit among us, and we lift our voices together as we pray, as you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to give our tithes and offerings this morning, we recognize that everyone has a different financial situation. So that we might continue our vital ministries here in our community and throughout the world, we simply invite you to give as you are able and as you feel led. For those of you worshiping with us online, you may give via the options listed on the screen or in the chat. Let us offer our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, and our hearts to God who loves us unconditionally.
in peace, living out the greatest commandment, taking time to rest, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and transforming those actions, whether they're the most important thing you're doing that day or the most mundane, into sharing the love of God with others. Go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.